represent TMT Law Practice in India. The firm is recognized for its media and entertainment focus and advises some of India's most prominent sector clients. Abhishek Malhotra, the firm's managing partner, will discuss personality rights, privacy, and content regulation in the digital domain. Abhishek will be joined by media lawyers at the firm, Sabna Chirajia, Bagana Chandorka, and Anushri Iwali. Lawyers will provide a summary of the recently notified intermediary guidelines and digital code of ethics, which governs news publishers and aggregators, as well as OTT platforms. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much for uh, having us um, to give our views from India on the aspects relating to the interesting developments that have been taking place in our country. Uh, while there is a lot in the media and in, in entertainment industry that's been happening in this last uh, over one, one and a half years, during which time we, the pandemic has ravaged the entire world. But uh, I know whether it is fortunate or unfortunate, the uh, Policy makers and legislators have not been sleeping, have, have been, you know, spending their time apart from the efforts in uh, addressing the issues arising out of the pandemic. So we will be discussing, um, you know, briefly two aspects that have really caught the attention of the media and of various businesses. One of those relates to the recently released uh, intermediary guidelines, the information technology rules concerning intermediary guidelines and the digital content control. This was released in February and parts of those have come into effect and uh, requirements of compliance have actually started taking place sometime earlier this month. So it's that current. Uh, we will also want to discuss the developments concerning the laws related press and specifically on personality rights, aspects of privacy. Uh, of course, the topic is too vast to be covered in this one session, but we will try to give you some snippets of what's happening in India. So without further ado, um, I'd like to you know, start off because we're doing this as an interactive session. I have uh, my partners from the firm, there's Sapna Chaurasya, there is Meghna Chinurkar, and there's Anushri Yabale, and I'm Abhishek Malhotra. Um, so, Sapna, um, the IT rules that have been notified in February, what are the kinds of businesses to whom these rules will be applicable? If you can just give us a brief introduction on that. Sure, Abhishek. Firstly, thank you for the introduction. Uh, yes, Abhishek, you're right. It has been an interesting time. Unfortunately, yes, apparently COVID is happening, but the lawmakers have been active. The intermediary guidelines and the digital media ethics code rule of 2021. This has been notified by the central government on 25th of February. And according to these uh, new IT rules, uh, they broadly apply to the following three categories. Now these categories also have their subsets. Um, so the broad categories are first is an intermediary, which is a wider umbrella by itself. And uh, under it, it has uh, social media intermediaries and significant social media intermediaries. The second category of business to whom the IT rules will be applicable are the publishers of news and current affairs content, uh, which has a subset of news aggregators. And the last uh, category is the publishers of online curated content. So broadly speaking, these are the three broad businesses to whom the new IT rules will be applicable. Uh, you know, when these uh, IT rules were notified and, and, you know, as the name suggests, what you just sort of highlighted to us, it relates to intermediaries. Yes. Uh, I can understand that there are portions applicable to intermediaries per se. But uh, tell me, what are the contours of applicability of these regulations to um, entities such as the OTT platform? What is this concept of the online curated content that you just referred to? Sure. So, uh, so when we talk about publishers of online curated content, uh, these are players uh, 
who play a significant role in determining the online curated content which is being made available or they themselves make uh, make available this content but interestingly uh, it excludes individuals or users who are um, not transmitting online uh, curated content in the course of a systematic business professional or commercial activities so when you when you're curating content and not making it available uh, as part of a commercial activity that is excluded from your online curated content and to broadly broadly put it uh, the online curated content would include whether it's a content that you know you are uh, creating it all by yourself you are procuring it on a license basis or you're making the same available on the ott platform but uh, in terms of uh, you know when when we speak of curated content and when we talk about publishers of curated content yeah. the understanding would be perhaps that uh, these are people who are responsible for their own content which is what you also just highlighted what in your mind would be the um, the reason to include them under the head of rules that are going to be notified or have been notified for intermediaries i mean and what was the background why did you think that there was a need for uh, uh, any kind of legislation or any kind of rules to be regulating such content uh so abhishek to my mind uh the reasons are twofold uh one probably is uh the failure on the part of the ott platforms to come together and have a self regulatory mechanism and the second is uh is somewhat a lack of legislation uh which in turn led to a lot of complaints being filed uh to elaborate on this aspect uh india has had the cinematographic act which is enacted in 1952 thereafter we've got the cable television network regulations which is finds its existence sometimes in the 90s now what these two re- legislations do is they primarily regulate content which is either released theatrically or which is made available via satellite uh so what has happened is um, ott as a platform didn't have existence in that era and bearing this in mind these legislations do not really cover ott platforms there are loopholes there are limitations in these acts so the ott players uh, till date uh, before of course the rules came into existence were having a free a free field and were publishing content as they would they would deem fit uh bearing that in mind the other aspect when you look at even from the ministry aspect there was a lot of indecisiveness indecis- between the ministry of information uh, sorry ministry of electronics and information technology that's meti and ministry of information and broadcasting as to which is the authority which would regulate the content that is being made available on ott platform with so much chaos and so much uncertainty uh what happened is the consumers or the viewers uh have initiated a lot of litigations now these litigations have been filed in several courts they are pending across the countries primarily these litigations seek to uh have a framework or some sort of sort of guidelines to regulate the content which is being made available on digital platforms because it appears that people have had grievances that ott platform show content which is either violent uh contains obscene scenes or uh, is 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 inappropriate in nature so keeping this in mind there are several litigations which are pending there are some which have been decided most of which are pending uh and the chances of having contrary orders have also increased bearing this in mind the government has recently moved a transfer petition to the supreme court so hopefully very soon uh, there would be a judgment which would be passed which will give clarity to this whole aspect but having said that also another nuance that got introduced was while these transfer petitions are pending before the supreme court uh to have clarity on having guide guidelines or or a regulatory framework to 
control or to govern the OTT platforms, these new IT rules have come in place. So to my mind, Abhishek, these are the two primary reasons uh, why this rule has really, so to say, come into existence. Mm. No, no, I think it's interesting because of the fact that, um, you know, as you rightly said, uh, there was an absence of not only meeting of the minds amongst the OTT players, but uh, I think they were given an opportunity to come out with a self-regulatory code themselves, not only a code by which they would be governed, but also a mechanism to address the grievances that are or are likely to be raised from time to time. But I don't think that they met the threshold that was being looked at by the ministry. And, um, you know, uh, of course, the other interesting proposition in this is that uh, for the longest time, the government of India, in response to such public interest litigation, uh, requesting or, or seeking directions from the court to put into place a system of uh, regulation of the content or, or uh, a certification uh, prior in time to the release of such content, the government always took the stand that these platforms are intermediaries. And because they are intermediaries, therefore they will not, they will give them the safe harbor as long as of course they comply with the requirements of the law that they would be take down in the event that there is a, a direction from the court or from the relevant official, et cetera. But um, I, I, you know, because of the fact that uh, not only did the government realize that the content that is actually going on such platforms is not just third party con content, but also stuff that is curated by them. And also because, you know, there was a response to the overall hue and cry multiple litigations being filed all across the country that you mentioned is where uh, I think the genesis of these regulations are. Um, That's correct, Abhishek. I mean, there is a lot, I, I would think that is these to these two factors which have contributed uh, to these new IT rules coming into existence. Abhishek, having said that, you know, it's, it's very um, surprising today when you look at the, these new IT rules, uh, which typically is being governed by two ministries and you having vast experience, not only on the media and entertainment side of the business, but also having worked on information and technology side, what do you think is the possible reason uh, for the inclusion of online curated content within the ambit of IT rules? Okay, it's, you know, uh, and we have advised certain clients in the recent past uh, in relation to this question, you know, they asked us as to whether uh, it makes sense or it is constitutionally permissible for content regulation to be brought within the scope of the information technology ministry and or uh, classifying them as intermediaries. Because whereas, as I said earlier, such platforms were classified as intermediaries, but there has been a, 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 you know, a change in that perspective. In fact, in November of 2020, these, uh, there, was a, there was an amendment to what we refer to as the allocation of business rules. And perhaps uh, you know, people uh, uh, who are listening to us in this, uh, in this webinar and those who come from the UK and, and the administrative law background from there would perhaps understand that the manner in which the bureaucracy works and, and the government works, there is an allocation of certain business given to each ministry. And we have the Allocation of Business Rules Act of, of uh, 1961, under which each ministry is identified and what its scope of activity and administration or administrative control is, is clearly defined there. Now, information technology aspects were under the uh, you know, overall governance structure of the Ministry of Electronics and IT. Uh, but I guess the, the realization was that with time, there is a convergence between the pure content aspects and the uh, information technology aspects. So it was clarified in November 2020 that whereas the IT or technology aspects will continue to be dealt with by the METI, by Ministry of Electronics and IT, However, 
the entertainment content and the news content will be governed by the ministry of information and broadcasting which had been governing content so it's very surprising that when these it rules have come out and this is perhaps the first time in constitution or administrative law history in india that this has happened that the rules are being notified under the provisions of the information technology act but the governance of that is being split between the two ministries to the extent that your intermediaries you will be governed by the uh, administrative setup of the meti and to the extent that it is talking about publishers of content it will be governed by mib ministry of information and broadcasting so uh, the constitutional validity of this course of action in itself in my mind is suspect it's another thing that with regard to uh, online curated content because there was such a human cry and there were criminal complaints filed and there were multiple such litigations all across the country which had culminated in the transfer petition that you mentioned uh you know businesses don't like litigation so they like some amount of certainty so till now they were trying to figure out as to what exactly should be the kind of content that goes online today thankfully uh, even though constitutional arguments may be available to experts but uh, from a from a commercial standpoint from a practical standpoint i think the ott platforms are saying at least we have something to go by there's a document released by the government of india which sets out certain uh, terms and conditions or or certain steps that we need to follow and if we are to follow that we are protected and that's the kind of argument that we they are likely to take in court in the event that they are uh, beset by any such further litigation so i think that's the so uh, background to why online curated content came to be included and why it is going to it has already gained acceptability and it's likely to continue to get that acceptability at least as far as the curated content is uh, you know concerned yeah and you're right abhishek somewhere you know it's going to be very interesting to see how these two ministries really the interplay between the two ministries though there's a separate allocation of which ministry is going to look into which aspect but the interplay between the two ministry will be an interesting aspect to wait and watch as to how the whole it rules really pan out bearing that in mind abhishek uh, you rightly mentioned right now that the businesses do not like litigation and given the fact that the ott platforms for the reasons you know uh, as i earlier mentioned were facing a lot of litigations across the country i'm sure they must be breathing a sigh of relief with the new it rules coming into the job but uh, what do you think is the justification to bring in the news and current affairs uh, within the uh, realm of this new it rules that's a uh, you know very pertinent question and you know it, it goes into the entire uh, jurisprudence and question being raised with regard to the the amount of fetters or Uh, limitations that can be prescribed vis-a-vis the press you know always a a sticky issue and we've had multitudes of litigations beginning with uh, you know the uh, imposition of cess on newspapers to uh, the kind of justification that is permissible under the cinematograph act on on uh, on censorship and and then of course going into the television domain and now of course the internet uh of course there was as has been the case in other parts of the world there was a growing concern with regard to fake news and that fake news whether it be on news portals or it be on uh, on uh, other media on social media was an ongoing concern in fact there's some multitudes of cases is pending in the indian courts concerning that what i find um you know to my mind unjustifiable is when you are calling these people publishers and, and you know it equally applies in the case of online curated content but i guess that industry has made made its peace with these regulations i don't think the news industry has and we are likely to perhaps see some litigation in this regard but when when you label me as a publisher i am no longer an intermediary if not i am not an intermediary how can you justify inclusion of limitations or regulations upon me under the guidelines which refer to intermediaries it it stems from uh section 87 uh you know 2 zg which talks about guidelines to be implemented for intermediaries that's the the parent provision under which these rules have been framed but i am not an intermediary by the very definition 
So if I'm not an intermediary, how are you trying to control me? Number one. Two, no distinction has been made. In fact, uh, I mean, it's to the contrary. Uh, no distinction has been made between those news channels that are carrying linear feed and just make, being made available on OTT platforms and those that have been created only for the digital media and those that are news aggregators, pure and simple. In fact, news aggregators are included within the definition of publishers of news and online current, current affairs con content. So, and this is what happens when you are looking at a problem from a platform stroke technology point of view, you ignore the nuanced difference in the from the content point of view, how it is being received. And that's the reason why this is a problem. And uh, more, you know, more so the issue that has been raised is when this news content is being made available on OTT platforms as linear channels, OTT platforms in turn are telling the news channel that look, we can't carry your news feed till such time that you adhere to the classification requirements that are applicable to us, to our online curated content. And the news channels are turning around saying, look, the definition of news and of curated content is different. In fact, it's exclusive. And the, the annexure, the schedule to the regulations which applies to online curated content is different from what applies to us, the news publishers. So how can you, uh, you know, tell us to have um, uh, classification requirements? And unlike entertainment content, which is created, recorded, and subsequently broadcast or made available, and therefore can be subjected to some sort of classification requirements, news by its very nature is live in most cases. You do not know what is going to be happening. I mean, you may have certain amount of control, but largely if it's live, then uh, you can't, you know, in the middle of it, suddenly insert a classification requirement, say that this is too violent and please do not watch it, etc. So it's, it's, it's completely antithetical. And that's what I said. It's when you classify on the basis of, when you go about creating rules on the basis of technology, you're necessarily falling foul with the, the aspect of, um, content. of uh, content. The other problem with this is that there is a foreign investment cap on any kind of news, specifically in the digital domain in India. So if there is a business that is in the business of uh, relaying news or making available news and current affairs in the digital media, either directly through a website or through a channel or whatever, or as being a news aggregator, then they cannot have more than 26% as foreign investment. Again, the, the problem is that if you make available this news on OTT platform, which otherwise are allowed to have 100% investment, does the making available of this news content on their platforms and thereby them being considered as news aggregators make them fall foul of the foreign policy, foreign investment policy? So it's, it's a multitude of issues that has arisen from that, which I don't think has been thought through by the ministries before they actually notified these rules. It was supposed to be targeted at intermediaries and maybe to a certain extent, social media intermediaries, to a certain extent, maybe the OTT platforms. But when you bring in news, it just opens a Pandora's box and, and, and leaves this nowhere. And there are other challenges as well. For example, the facsimile editions of or versions of a newspaper, a physical newspaper, printed newspaper, is exempted. But if you take snippets from it, then that's part of, and then you become a news aggregator. So the other argument that these news uh, channels, television channels uh, that are being subjected to these are raising with the ministry and the government is that why is there no parity when a printed publication on the digital version as is, is being exempted, my linear feed, which I am showing on my television channels, which are already regulated, onto the digital domain should also be exempted. The parity argument should apply here as well. And the last bit is they have put into place a self-regulatory mechanism or so, so they call it, yeah. where you're supposed to have a grievance redressal system within the organization at level one. If that does not uh, meet the expectation of the person who's raised the grievance, they can always go in a pellet sort of mechanism to the industry level body which is supposed to be headed by a retired Supreme Court or a High Court judge. 
and then you provide for a third tier which is governed completely by bureaucrats in the ministry so our constitution recognizes the principle of uh, separation of powers legislative power vests with the parliament administrative power or executive power vests with the government and judicial power vests with the judiciary you have recognized that by saying that the decision making at the level 2 self regulatory industry level platform level will be by headed by a, a retired judicial officer and then you say that that retired judicial officer who's a retired supreme court or high court judge will be subjected to appeal being administered by the executive the bureaucrats how is that going to be justifiable so a host of issues very interesting times good for us lawyers to not only debate but perhaps get into the litigation but uh, i mean this could be endless i i was part of a webinar where we were discussing these issues and there were multitudes of uh, you know um not only the issues raised but also opinions that came in and news always uh, you know generates that kind of passionate sort of debates and opinion so i think we could just go on but uh, unfortunately we don't have time for that um Uh, i would like to bring in uh, uh, you know i think sapna you have something something more yeah. to say before i i could yeah please yeah it's very interesting abhishek and particularly the fact about uh, about uh, the foreign direct investment bit that you that you bought in and just as a food for thought that probably that is the reason why these new rules have somewhere bought in the concept of significant social media intermediaries where there is a number of uh, where they are having the social media intermediaries having number of registered users in india as a concept but yeah you're right it's very interesting time as and as lawyers we always look forward for these interesting times yeah no so I, as i said since i was talking about the uh, the press and uh, and the uh, freedom of speech and expression and content regulation the other bits of development which have been very interesting over the last uh, little over a year have uh, come about in the area of the right of development of the right of privacy um and you know concomitant to that the personality rights right of publicity which uh, while there were some decisions in the past that touched upon those aspects but we really did not have a regime whereby we could advise clients to say that yeah in these circumstances this is the possible outcome because this is what judicial precedent has set out so um you know meghna and anushri uh, i'd like your thoughts on uh, what this development of the rights has been and uh, you know how that's being administered how we are seeing that play out in some of the decisions that have come about so over to you meghna okay. thank you abhishek um so as you rightly said freedom of speech and expression is a fundamental right and every person has the right to be able to express themselves the way they want to um not diametrically opposite but something that we, that you need to find a fine line to balance with is the right to privacy that each person is entitled to uh the right to privacy although not listed in the fundamental rights that are granted under the constitution was held to be a fundamental right granted to each individual by the supreme court of india quite a few years ago um another thing with the right to privacy is we we've, we've reached an age where a lot of our details are being made public through social media through you know access over the internet and uh, a lot of what used to be kept private about our lives is now public information which most people willingly publicize on their social media platforms and again as you said through other sources especially when it comes to celebrities and personalities the media is obtaining information and publicizing it uh, you know and making it available to the public so all of this starts bringing uh, a few questions into the foray where you start i mean the questions that were arising were how much can a person protect his personal information and his private information is there a difference between the two and uh, the interesting aspect of this and the question that started coming up uh, was on account of the fact that in the recent uh, in recent times the uh, the filmmakers have started making movies based on uh, known people on celebrities 
and uh, whether intentional or not, uh, it just so happens that the, the most uh, recent cases that have been, uh, the most recent films that have been made based on uh, famous people are about people who have already passed away, not people who are currently living people. Which also brings about a question mark on whether a person's right to privacy can be enforced posthumously or not. Do those rights exist after a person passes away? Uh, so now in India, while, while the constitution gives us the right to privacy under uh, Article 21, there is no statutory legislation which covers uh, publicity rights or personality rights. This is in uh, opposition to the situation in the US where it is recognized as a specific uh, right that can be protected against. Publicity rights are treated as commercial rights, uh, which, are, which can be commodified and exploited and monetized. So there's an economic angle attached with it. While the right to privacy uh, has been declared even by the UN as the right to keep one's life private and to prevent your reputation from uh, being harmed. Reputation has been recognized as a part of the right to privacy. Although the law of defamation does not fall within that, it's a separate act in itself. So defamation under India, uh, in India can be treated as a civil wrong as well as a criminal wrong. Uh, it's a civil wrong under torts, it's a criminal wrong under the IPC in India. So now what you can see and what is interesting is that because of the lack of specific statutory legislation, the right to privacy, the right to reputation, defamation, publicity, personality have all kind of been in intermingled and been used um, interchangeably. There's no clear definition of, you know, which clarifies what the difference is or what the thin lines are, which should distinguish the, you know, which should distinguish these rights from each other. And because of that lack, when in the recent cases that have been uh, uh, coming up, the courts have been talking about these um, in substitution of each other. So Anushri, um, we've recently looked at these cases in detail. Uh, do you think uh, you could tell us a bit about what the courts have said in the Sushant Singh Rajput case and the Jayalalita case? Of course. Uh, thank you, Meghna. So uh, just hopping on to what Meghna said, like in this in this age, which is filled with biopics and docu-series and documentaries, which focus on individuals and um, exemplifying, portraying or, your, their lives and trying to draw messaging from their lives, it um, it's come to a point where, like Meghna rightly said, where um, people are more aware of their rights and want to control the amount of information and the use of such information about themselves. So uh, referring to the cases that Meghna just talked about, a recent uh, a double bench uh, judgment where the, and the issue of posthumous rights specifically came up. Here we're talking about a diseased person, uh, a diseased person and his heirs coming, reaching out to the courts to try and uh, protect the person who has uh, passed away. So in, in uh, like Meghna said, when these as reach out to court, if, for example, in the Jaya Lalita case that we're talking about, which is a very recent case, uh, it was an appeal file before the double bench because a single uh, judge refused to grant an injunction against a book and against a web series, two separate uh, pieces of work based on two separate books. So an injunction was refused. So the heir was aggrieved by this and reached out to the, uh, and filed an appeal saying that the, uh, uh, the film and the web series were tarnishing the image of the deceased person over here. So I just uh, wanted to also bring in uh, Anushri. You may need to clarify that Jailalita for the, for the audience. Uh, she was a chief minister of one of the largest states in the south, Tamil Nadu, and she herself was uh, an ex. Uh, you know, she used to act. She was an actor in in some films uh, originating from there, and a very very uh, famous actor. Um, and, and it's in that context that uh, this litigation started. And, and that's the reason why her life story was being portrayed as a biopic in a web series and, and was the subject matter of the book that was being written about. Please, please continue. Anusha. 
Um, so when we we see uh, recently while we see uh, cases like this where an heir has approached the court, we see the court pr uh, proceed very cautiously. So dealing specifically with your posthumous rights of privacy and personality, uh, we see when it comes to film specifically, I'm leaving web series out of this for a specific reason, uh, in the Sushant Singh Rajput case that also Meghna mentioned and the Jailalita one that we're just talking about, the courts in both these uh, cases seem to rely on the fact that films already go through um, censor censorship and certification. There is already a pre-existing mechanism that exists to before the film is released to um, kind of, uh, you know, which goes through, for a lack of better words, a fact check to make sure that's in compliance with all laws. So when the question is always posed to the court in terms of can I as an heir you know, exercise the posthumous rights of uh, pu privacy or publicity uh, in form on for and behalf of my heir. The courts tend to stir away from that and not heavily opine on it and rely on the entire censorship mechanism as a fallback, saying that given that the uh, films are anyways going to go through certification, usually there is also your uh, disclaimer at the beginning of a film, which uh, either to nowadays the way the trend of the films are it's always a it's a it's an inspired film it's a it's not it's never directly based on which is a ground that's taken up very often by producers or different defendants in in these different uh, cases that um anything that has that goes for certification has a disclaimer it kind of um the courts steer away from really opining on it and try to go within the safety of the fact that this is an old i would not say old but a more traditional practice followed in india of not really opining on whether yes a heir can invoke posthumous rights or not but just relying on the fact that there is something that we can fall back upon let the body that's already been created your sensor board deal with it and then pre Pre this is obviously pre-exhibition. So all these cases tend to be moved before the court, before the uh, film or web series actually is aired or to be broadcasted. So at a pre-stage pre or pre-broadcasting stage, the courts are very um, not inclined to uh, really pass any comment on whether the posthumous rights can be um, exercised or not. That being said, based on the Puttaswami judgment that Meghna mentioned, which... Uh, relied on the fact that the right of privacy under Article 21 of the Indian Constitution is actually um, a right, it's a fundamental right. Now, recognizing that um, it's an inalienable right. So you're born with it and um, you basically extinguishes with you. So the courts in every single judgment have mentioned that since your privacy uh, rights are something that are inalienable, inalienable and that your uh, publicity rights stem from it, are born from it, are related to it. They always seem to be drawing a linkage between the two rights. So um, instead of dealing with the me uh, the different, uh, you know, the aspects and the crux of the two uh, rights, they kind of see what's born from and tend to be uh, are more inclined to treating your publicity, posthumous publicity rights, the way your publicity, uh, your uh, privacy rights are treated. Basically, the in in a in a nutshell that if your publicity rights extinguish with you your personality rights also should um this is a tricky part of uh, uh, you know of these judgments given that your privacy rights are a, obviously a personal right it's about what you would like the public to know about you not getting into the aspect of whether the veracity of it which is more to do with defamation while your publicity rights is your monetization, it's a purely commercial right, but how you control the usage of your entire, your looks and your likeness and your personality and your voice, identify traits. So the court kind of skims over the fact that yes, one is a personal right, one is a commercial right, but because your publicity right is born, like a genesis, it's from your privacy rights, they, are more in, they seem to be more inclined to uh, correlating the two and allowing your uh, personality rights to kind of flow and take the path of your right of privacy, which is basically it extinguishes with you. Uh, Meghna, anything else that you would like to add on over here, Abhishek? Um, I'm so sorry I dropped off because of the electricity. So can no, you that's, just give me uh, a that's one of the advantages, advantages of Meghna that we have of uh, 
not being physically present in today's world advantage or disadvantage no but uh, anushi just sort of um, adding to no, no worries on that uh, um, anushi just adding to what you also were saying with regard to the sushant singh rajput case and you know just getting the entire framework with regard to the interplay between the right of privacy publicity defamation all those aspects being looked at by the courts in the recent times you know the interesting part of this is that the the right in itself even the right of privacy whereas it was recognized in a certain limited sort of sense as a tortious right to be enforced at a private level and there were certain other contours to it at a public law level at the constitutional level but it is only upon the pronouncement of the putsami judgment about 2 or 3 years ago that we see a well defined sort of realm of privacy the right of privacy which can be actually be enforced against the state against government uh and and that in itself the jurisprudence on that in itself will develop in times to come because whereas you are broadly defining as to the uh, you know giving a pronouncement on the fact that the right of privacy is part of the right of um you know life and personal liberty but how that plays out what are the situations where the a citizen can take action against the government for infringement or impingement of that is something that we will see but more interestingly from a commercial aspect uh how does that right of privacy get enforced against on a private level individual to individual individual to company or company to another company if at all um uh and also the aspect of um, you know what would be the contours in terms of a uh, whether there is a conflict between the freedom of speech and expression on the one hand and the privacy right on the other both constitutional rights both guarantees under the constitution but interestingly the point is that 191a which talks about the freedom of speech and expression is not an absolute right it is caveated by exceptions right. one of which is uh, that you can by law limit the application of the right of freedom of speech and expression now we don't have a legislation as you rightly said anushree governing privacy it is still in the works the data protection uh, bill personal data protection bill has been on the anvil for the last about ever since the judgment in putasami uh, came out so uh, we are likely to see that you know maybe being notified this year or the next but we don't have that law we do have aspects of privacy being uh, you know um, looked into let's say under the it act or the rbi regulation the reserve bank of india regulations and certain different aspects of that you know uh, um, looking at it from a from a healthcare perspective etc but we don't have a comprehensive legislation which you can use as a statutory basis and a clear statutory basis to be able to enforce that right so in those circumstances what happens is the first part which again is much beyond the scope of this webinar but what you were specifically referring to is that even the right of publicity and and which is where megna we'd like you to sort of uh, come in to uh, give us your views on on the jurisprudential theories on the basis of which the right of publicity was being looked at prior to the putaswami judgment and what according to you would be the basis subsequent to that judgment and then of course how that plays out in the sense of posthumous rights so over to you um so abhishek the putaswami judgment uh, basically said that the right to privacy is an inalienable right and it dies along with the person it um, didn't specifically opine on publicity rights there was no uh, definite answer over there though they did in a manner touch upon it by recognizing the concept of uh, publicity rights which is the right uh linked with a person's attributes and his personal identification and how it should it uh, could probably be an economic right and could be monetized and how that should be looked into but not specifically uh, there was no specific opinion passed on it uh, 
you know, in the Putraswami judgment. Now, before that also, there were few references to it. And even after that, there have been uh, judgments which have touched upon it, but there is no specific law as yet which recognizes this concept or has upheld that a person, a celebrity or an individual is entitled to prevent his personal attributes from being um, used. Uh, as as Anushri said, basically, uh, with while touching upon the subject, the courts don't pass a judgment on it. They instead go into other factors, and uh, you know, I'm sorry. Uh, no, but uh, you know, this is apart from the fact other factors that they are going into, like the. the uh, one of them, of course, is the aspect of, you know, uh, and you know, the reason why we don't have that uh, jurisprudence around this is because some of or some or most of these orders have been passed at the interim stage. So as a matter of law, while there could be these certain instances that have come about where an opinion has been expressed either in the passing um, or otherwise, for example, the one case where um, the right of privacy argument was raised as a central proposition in 2003 was uh, where, interestingly, the International Cricket Council claimed a right of publicity in an event, the ICC Cricket World Cup. And the court said the right of publicity exists in jurisprudence, but it can't be applicable to an event. But you're right that we've not had a determinative, uh, conclusive answer on what exactly is the right of publicity, where it flows from, and what its contours are. And which is why uh, I think uh, you were also perhaps talking about the, the two situations in terms of the basis as to whether it is the right of uh, privacy or otherwise. Um, Arishak, in the Sushant Singh Rajput, I'm so sorry, Anushri. No. Uh, in the Sushant, Sushant Singh Rajput case, which recently, uh, the, the judgment that recently came out, the judge has said that because there is no statutory legislation which, de, uh, which governs publicity rights or personality rights, he is forced to opine or he's forced to think about the fact that it will evolve from the right to privacy only and that it is linked with it. So, if the Supreme Court has held that the right to privacy dies with a person, he said he is, he, 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 I'm sorry, but what he said is then he is forced to also find that even the right to publicity should expire with a person. So he has said that these rights are linked with and um, come out of the umbrella of privacy rights. So because of the lack of spe uh, any specific legislation, this is what uh, he is forced to interpret. Mm, yeah, no, I know. Anushu, no, no, sorry. Just, yeah. Yeah, sorry. I was just jumping onto the point that you made about balancing your freedom of speech and expression versus your right of privacy. Um, relating this back to the Sushant Singh Rajput uh, case that we're discussing, where the father obviously has tried to injunct any kind of material, which is your film, web series, anything coming out on the life of his son. Uh, over here, the court actually did specifically discuss uh, this point, saying that film uh, and they kind of opined and leaned towards um, your freedom of expression, protecting your right under Article 191, saying that specifically that as filmmakers, as producers, you are not bound to show, uh, you know, a certain version of facts that you construe to be true. So the, the, the event, as far as to say that, uh, the fact that there, is, there were newspaper articles and there was so much, um, you know, publicity and coverage around it. And at that point, the father didn't object to it. The same point about not object to it, objecting to it historically also came up in the case. Another case, which is what we I'll refer to as the Gangubai case over here, which is book on, which was, which is a movie based on Hussein Zaidi, who's a very famous um, author. It's based on one of the uh, chapters of his book, where again reliance was placed on the producers on the book, which is a very common practice. If you know that we always opine, saying you know take adaptation rights from a book because you have a layer of security. Um, it, it, 
talking about this Gangu Bai case also is very important because um, this was in the criminal matter. The court kind of took cognizance of the fact that just because a book was published, that does not completely preclude them from the uh, preclude the producers from the. They can't take that as you know as a security blanket. There are um, so we see the courts moving or like all over the place when it comes to producers. They want to protect their freedom of expression. And they want to kind of allow them to make uh, portray, you know, films and web series based on their version of facts. Uh, and also, they, on one hand, you see that the courts are not completely uh, happy or completely okay with the, uh, you know, producers blindly relying upon a book and taking, uh, you know, taking the defense of I'm using an adaptation right based on this book was already in the public domain for X number of years. So we see courts going both ways you know like trying to promote your freedom of expression and getting creative content out which is a stimuli especially in like the pandemic you know the lot of content has been very important uh, as opposed to um, trying to outline the contours of how far can you go and how much can you rely on what's already out there so the courts are yet to kind of opine fully on this matter but i think the point of whether you can uh, you know uh, rely on a previous material as the basis for creating a subsequent material will be a very interesting point for us to follow, like follow up and see through because um, largely as lawyers, I think we tend to always uh, fall back upon the fact that this was based on something, you know, completely. I have only adapted it from one version to the other. So when, if that line of argument comes crippling down, that will leave us fairly exposed because a lot of our uh, web series, in fact, a lot of popular films are based on books. They're all adaptations. And this is a trend that's being, you know, followed quite heavily right now. But Anushree, Sapna, sorry, uh, as a... sorry, sorry, Meghna. Yeah. Hi. Uh, no, I was just going to uh, put a little, shed a little bit of light on, on the fact that um, the courts have also held that a book will reach a smaller audience versus content in an audiovisual nature because of the fact that it is so easily accessible to people and you know uh, more widely publicized reaches a different set of people and uh, the impact of each kind of content is also different so when you see something visually it leaves a different impact so what the court held in the Gangubai case uh, the city civil court was that the promos uh, result in a fresh cause of action because people are seeing it and reacting to it now and they may not have had knowledge of the book earlier when it was published so that's another line that you know needs to be looked into yeah sorry Sapna sorry. you were saying something yeah I wish like, you know it's this whole thing of right to privacy and uh, right to freedom of speech and expression it's a very interesting debate because both these rights rights are secured by the constitution of india and having said that today yes today probably as uh, megra and anushri pointed out the courts have really not deep dived into the fact of uh, going into the privacy aspect and drawing a distinguished so to say between publicity right and privacy right and posthumous rights but i think it's more to do because uh, today it is at an interim stage and the other factors that both Anushri and Meghna were talking about play a very important role when, uh, when an argument is advanced to say that I am creating a content which is based on something that's already available in the public domain. My work is a fiction work. I'm going to fictionalize it. And also uh, a great reliance is placed on the fact that I'll be having a disclaimer saying that it's a fictional work. In that situation, how is it going to impact a person's uh, uh, privacy is something that will really have to be tested. No, that's true. And uh, I think uh, overall, you know, the general principles as probably also been seen that from these cases that we just discussed is that uh, courts typically shy away from granting orders uh, before publication of any content happens because the perceived threat that the plaintiff is trying to bring to the notice of the court that is likely to follow in terms of an injury to the plaintiff is something which is very difficult to ascertain. Once it has been published, it's easier to figure out whether this would, is or is likely to have caused that injury. But before publication, it's often very difficult to do so, especially because the disclosure 
is limited it's given to the court the court has to opine on that and and the courts typically do not want to exercise that such discretion unless it's a, like a it's a huge departure from what the original version was or what the factual scenario is likely to have been and there is enough evidence placed before the court at that preliminary, preliminary level for it to take that prime officer side view so i think that's where the difficulty and as you rightly pointed out sapna and megna with is with regard to the the preliminary nature at which these orders have currently come about and uh, of course the sensationalization that has happened with the relevant characters who've been central to to these cases but um, it's uh, you know um, broadly summarizing uh, right of privacy is there it's established its contours are going to be uh, spelt out by court from time to time right of publicity seems to have its genesis from the right of privacy and not from common law unfair competition as we were earlier also perceiving it to perhaps have likely to been uh and and therefore because privacy is inalienable and so intrinsically connected to the individual that when the individual passes away and therefore the right of privacy gets extinguished possibly the right of publicity does get extinguished also and that's what seems to suggest from the overall scenario but just leaving one sort of final interesting uh aspect to consider and ponder for the audience before we uh, go over to taking questions uh is that under copyright law you have this concept of moral rights and moral rights are also supposed to be as inalienable to an individual as perhaps privacy would be because that has the right of attribution the right against any mutilation etc interestingly the copyright act when it was amended in 2012 provided for that moral right to be inherited by the legal representatives post of course uh, passing away of the individual so interesting dichotomy and perhaps an argument could be raised in court that look it's not completely abhorrent to law or unknown to indian jurisprudence that you could have the survival of a right even after passing away of the individual the flip side of that is if the legislature intended for it to be provided it should have specifically spelled it out and not left it for us to decide so in our view if we are limit we have to opine upon it right of uh, that particular right will die with the person so i think there's a lot of stuff that we've thrown out there and um, thank you so much um, sapna megna and uh, anushri for this engaging discussion and uh, you know now we can perhaps field some questions sapna you wanted to say something before we go over no, the just, questions just one last thought you rightly said with regards to the copyright act interestingly this fact will also have to be tested under the indian succession act because will this Correct. will this act is something that will survive once a person dies and that's not what our indian right. succession act says let's take another short break away from the screen we'll resume with the start of our entertainment session with a presentation from mark hill from charles russell speechfees mark will present on the changing media landscape in the middle east 